Hello and welcome back to the Armour Men's Health Show. I'm Dr. Mystery, your host, joined as always with my co-host, Donna Lee. Hey everybody, thank you so much for listening to the show and sharing it with all of your friends. Yeah, we would appreciate you sharing it with your friends. Mm -hmm. When we have uh, listeners that come into the office, they are well-primed to understand what holistic urology is all about. Mm -hmm. They understand that they're going to be offered not just surgical options, but also non-surgical, sometimes some holistic options. You're going to be offered counseling on dietary and supplement uh, alterations that we want you to make. You're going to be given the latest and greatest in regenerative options and really a, uh, a real aim to care for the whole person, not just the things between the nipples and the knees. That's right. I think holistic urology, too, is such an interesting buzz phrase that we've created because I've interviewed lots of urologists around the country, and they're like, what in the world does that mean? Yes, because it's you can make surgery. this job You can make this job very trained monkey, or you can make it <laughs> elegant trained monkey. That's One right. of the two. We like elegant trained monkeys. <laughs> How do people become our patients? You can call us and learn all about the elegant trained monkeys at 512-238-0762. Our website, as you well know, is armormenshealth.com, and we we are in Round Rock, North Austin, South Austin, and Dripping Springs, Texas, y'all. So be sure to reach out to us. We're here to help. So uh, once again, we're joined by one of the partners at NAU Urology Specialists, my brother from another mother, Dr. Lucas Giacomides. Thanks a lot for joining us, Lucas. Thank you, Armando. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to um, uh, our you know, mutual treatment of patients, uh, we, you know, we, we certainly uh, do a lot of things the same. We do some things differently. Uh, but I kind of wanted to explore your treatment algorithm and how you counsel patients that have been diagnosed with prostate cancer that we know has been uh, localized to the prostate. So um, you know, you're diagnosed with prostate cancer. What are some of the things that you think about and talk about when you're discussing treatment with a patient? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I usually see about one or two di new diagnosed prostate cancers a week, and in a perfect world, I'd like to see them at the end of the morning or the end of the day. And you know, sometimes it's just not feasible or practical to do. Um, but then sometimes I just re realign my whole schedule because I don't think it's a quick, easy, yeah, you've got a kidney stone, let's go get it out kind of conversation. It is complicated. A lot of the cancers that we see are pretty straightforward. You say you got a kidney tumor, you're going to take it out, or the whole kidney, or you got a bladder cancer, take it out, or the whole bladder. A testicle cancer, you take it out right away. But a prostate cancer has lots of flavors. So, you know, about 15 years ago, we were all challenged by the lay press to say we are doing way too much prostate cancer diagnosing and treating and we're mutilating men and we should never, ever check PSA. Because the idea here is that most men that are diagnosed with prostate cancer will never die from it. But some men with prostate cancer right. do die from it. And it's our job as the gatekeepers to try to figure out who those people are and then advise our patients as best as we can. That's right. And what I tell them, you'll never know if you need if, which one of those you're going to be unless you get a biopsy. And you never know if you're going to need a biopsy if you never check your PSA. And so these are very easy tests to do. And I like to think that I let people make the choice after I tell them, hey, here's your pros and cons of doing something. So when I get that di diagnosis, I think it's important to say, okay, stay standard biopsy, maybe 12 cores. We take 12 little pieces of the prostate out one by one. And you know how many of those were, came back positive for cancer, and then how aggressive they look on a microscope. Because that's what you can tell, not just whether you have cancer, but how much, where is it, and how aggressive it looks like. And if you do an MRI beforehand, we can even get a more targeted biopsy with an MRI-guided biopsy. Right. And I think it's important also to get a general picture of the guy's health. Um, you know, also I ask him how old were your parents when they died. You know, I, I'll never forget telling, asking a patient that, and he came to me 80 years of old, and he had a 30-year-old wife and a five-year-old son, and and yeah. I said, how old are your parents when they die? And he says, they're in the waiting room. They're alive. They're 105. <laughs> so you just, you never want to be ages. People, you know, if you've wow. got about a 10. That's right. Having an age-related cutoff doesn't make any sense in a society that's both aging and getting healthier as they it, get older. It's something that you look at the person and say, is this person going to be around in 10 to 15 years? And if so, could this prostate cancer kill them? And, and I think that's when you kind of make the decisions about how to go down the road, what to do about it. So traditionally, we've offered people radical prostatectomy, which we do robotically. Then there are a number of different options that can be done from a, um, uh, a radiation standpoint. And we've talked about both of those uh, on the show at, at great length. Why don't we talk a little bit about active surveillance, watchful waiting, and molecular testing? What, 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 what do these words mean, and, and what's their role? Well, active surveillance, watchful waiting, a lot of times are used interchangeably. But I had a patient that hated when I said watchful waiting. He was like, no. 
I went to a doctor that's doing active surveillance. Really? I was like, oh, man. Same thing. It's just the same same word. It's just the same thing. (laughs) I don't like you, Dr. Mystery. I wanted active surveillance, not watchful waiting. (laughs) You're right. But I've always thought there was a little bit of a difference. No. I'm just a little bit, and maybe I'm going to do more biopsies to you. I'll definitely do more biopsies, so don't worry. That's right. I definitely am an active surveillance guy. I'm very active. So, you know, the point is, uh, you know, for a lot of times if you're, let's say, a 75, 80-year-old, and you have one positive biopsy, and it's the least aggressive Gleason score, three plus three equals six, that you'll see typically. That's a that's a guy who can probably watch it. You know, that's the kind of guy you don't want to say it's like killing a fly with a bazooka gun. You know, we're just going to see what this thing does. And if it starts to turn ugly, then we rebiopsy you and see if now you have a Gleason eight. You know, something much more aggressive, and all your biopsies are positive. So, so that's what I look at as far as active surveillance. And I I, I think every patient's different. To be honest with you, I don't know if you have a different uh, criteria how you watch these guys. For everyone, I usually do a PSA every six months, and I do a repeat biopsy at a year in everyone. Um, and uh, I guess that's just the kind of way that I developed. Yeah, I think six months is standard. I think um, a lot of times I'll look for the trigger to get me to then say, okay, we missed your, we didn't see any cancer the first time. Now you got a PSA that's a couple points higher. Now let's do an MRI again, see if anything changed, and then rebiopsy anything that looks suspicious. A lot of times that's the direction I'll go. And there are uh, not only MRIs, but now we have molecular genetic tests that we can do on the biopsy specimens to tell us not only is it objectively look dangerous to the pathologist, but on a molecular level, do the genes look like this is going to be a more active cancer? And that can help me decide who is a good active surveillance candidate as well. Yeah, there are three uh, companies at least that offer this. Um, I'm curious what your algorithm is, if there's someone that you say look at. But basically, we're trying to say not just a Gleason score, how many biopsies are positive. What is your, I mean, let's face it, I tell it's like having COVID. We're all going to get COVID. Just don't die of it. So as a man, you know, we're going to get prostate cancer. Just find out which one's going to kill you. And I would say conventional wisdom tells me that I think our patients out there think that we actually do more tests than we actually do, meaning that they expect us to have a lot more innate knowledge of their disease process than sometimes we're given with a simple pathology report. And I think that we are entering that that era of molecular medicine where we're going to have that. So both of us do HIFU, or high-intensity focused ultrasound, which is a fourth way to address cancer. So, you know, watchful waiting, radical prostatectomy, radiation therapy, and then now this HIFU therapy. And not not very many urologists in the country do this. You and I probably are in a in a field of about 100 urologists in this country that offer this procedure. What has been your experience with high-intensity focused ultrasound for prostate cancer? I, I've been very happy with it. Um, we've been doing it now for about five years. And um, I just remember the very first day I did them, I did two. The second guy I did that day um, went home and ran a a 10K the following week after surgery and, you know, ran a personal best. So, you know, he he's a little picture he sent me and we published it in a running magazine because it's just to tell people you can get back on your feet in no time. So it's a lot, it's very useful for those who really just are nervous about watchful waiting, active surveillance, whatever you want to call it. And that's where I use it. I actually have very few patients on watchful waiting, uh, uh, you know, because we can offer a treatment that is minimally invasive, very quick has very little downtime, and has very low side effect uh, profile. So risks of impotence and incontinence are very low with high-intensity focused ultrasound, especially if it's kind of tailored. And uh, and I've been very pleased with it. More and more insurances are, are paying for it. Our cash pay price is the lowest in the country at 13500 And uh, although not everybody's a candidate, Many people are good candidates for high-intensity focused ultrasound. Well, people do push the envelope. I, my, I think my third patient was a Gleason 8 cancer that had a surgery scheduled with another urologist. And, and I said, you need to get your prostate out. I agree with him. He goes, oh, no, I'm not getting my prostate yes, out. Yes, because ultimately it's <laughs> the patient's decision. If he they may, don't want to have it done, they're not going to have it th- done. This guy was classic, though. He went to a urologist and said, do, would you do a Gleason 8 HIFU? And he goes... Uh, I not only would I do it, I had Gleason 8 cancer and I had it done on me. This patient is now also about five years out with no evidence of disease. So he's, he, in, in any sense, me his Gleason 9 brother. And I go, look, we're pushing our luck. Here, you know? so, <laughs> so, yeah, you have to be careful. Not everyone's a candidate, but, you know, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at how many are. And we are just about to embark upon a new era in this city where we have the fanciest, most uh, uh, most technologically advanced machine. We have the, the new Focal One HIFU machine that's coming to town. It has MRI guidance capabilities. It is uh, state-of-the-art. Uh, this coming week, I'll be doing my first case uh, on, a, uh, on a doctor's dad 
who um, has an a, you know an MRI seen lesion, and we're gonna you know we're gonna take care of it and ablate it using this Haifu. I'm I'm very excited. Oh, I'm very excited to hear it too. I mean, it sounds amazing. And from a recovery standpoint, what are you telling patients on how long it takes to recovery and, and what are some common post-operative symptoms? I, I tell them if I have to treat the whole prostate, I'm probably going to recommend to do a, a resection or an aquablation, something that's going to open up the inside to minimize their risk of having trouble urinating afterwards. Um, you know, you have to respect that some prostates are big and if you, you know, do it all at once, they're going to have trouble going and you don't want to do surgery if you can avoid it after the uh, HIFU ablation. Uh, if I do one side, a lot of times I tell them we don't have to. You know, if you don't have any symptoms, we don't have to. Um, but I, we do send them home with a catheter, usually for about five to seven days, um, just to make sure that they're going to be fine afterwards. And then, like I said, you're not going to necessarily run a 10K and get a PR from it, but I tell them you can probably be Go back there. to work and you're going to be just fine. You can go to work the next week. I mean, the, the day surgery, no admission. I mean, you know, just have to tell them that, yeah, it's a catheter, but it's not two weeks. Like and and, and we, we love second opinions. Second opinion mystery, mm -hmm. they call me. And uh, and I'll give you a third and fourth one if you really want it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, coming to us to a visit with Dr. Giacomides about your prostate cancer di uh, diagnosis is your first step to get a high food. Donna, how do they get a hold of us? Call us at 512-238-0762.